Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all thy mind. And this is the first, and this is the great commandment. And the Bible later goes on and says, And all the rest of the things shall be hung on this one thing. Literally meaning, if you could get this right, everything else in your life is going to start working out. But you cannot miss this. And I know everybody's sitting there saying, Pastor, you have preached this for how many weeks? I know, I know, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And I, I mean, it's, it is, this is a complete takeover of the inner man. To have fellowship with God, to worship God, to love Him with your mind, to know God, to love Him with your heart. To, and what's going to happen is all of that's going to come out of you. We talked last week about how God changes you. Man, God comes in and renews. And I gave that illustration of my basement, how I bought my house, and it had a giant wet bar in my basement. And it's my, it's my playroom, hangout room for my kids. I went down there with a sledgehammer. We ripped it out. Do you know why? I'm transforming it from the inside to resemble like my family, not like who was there before. God saved you. Do you guys know that? If you've been saved, God saved you. What God does is he walks into your house and says, that's got to go, that's got to go, that's got to go, because that does not resemble me. And he cleans you up and he cleans you out. And all of a sudden, everything that God takes out, you didn't need. Everything that you put, that God puts in, you can't live without. And a lot of times we say, well, that's a good thing. If God gave it to you, it's a necessity. It's not a good thing. I mean, it is a good thing, but it's not only a good thing. <laughs> That's going to be one thing they tweet. <laughs> right, right. Now notice this. Verse 39, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Your kids, your wife, your boss, your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law. <laughs> See, the thing is, you can't love them the way you should love them, if you don't do the first thing, you'll never do the second thing. You guys get that? Love God, take over, renewing of your mind, changing of your heart, changing your, uh, uh, what comes out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you get around your mother-in-law and all you can do is, here she goes again, blah, blah, and all you're, you're grumbling the whole time, it's because your heart is not right. And you can't change your heart. God changes your heart. And this is a commandment. Man, it's, it, it, it's, it's God's love. It, it comes from God. It's God in you. It's God coming out of you. Let, let him be seen in me, like Pastor Tyler and Miss Kayla just sang a minute ago. Now turn in the Gospels. We're, we're going to connect the dots here. John 15, verse 12. And we'll go down to Philippians, and we'll stay there for the rest of the time. Here we see this again. John 15, verse 12. Same thing again. This is my suggestion no, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I, now, I, I could get this. It, it goes on and it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you he, he, Jesus didn't come down the earth and he walked on the earth and says, love you guys. Hey, love you. I love you guys. I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not downing that. Man, I, I do that all the time. I do I love my church family. I love being here. I love being with you guys. I, I love God's people. I, I, I love to show God's love. I love it. It's just, and you just say you're building yourself. No, it's not me. Trust me. It's not me. It's God working in me. It, it's not us at all. But his love was an action. It was intentional. It was sacrificial. It was given. It changed us. It met my greatest need. It drew me closer to God. And now you guys are saying, so wait, wait a minute. If his love changed you, impacted you, met my greatest need, and now God's saying to love others the way he loved us. You guys are going to start seeing how this comes together. His love impacted us in a significant way. Let me ask you a question. Does your love for the people in your row right now, or the people behind you, or the people you drove here with, or the people you talked to in the hallway, are they impacted by your love in that way? Who could I have stand right now? And I'm not going to do this. Who could I have stand right now and just say, how, tell me the story of somebody in this room that has impacted you this past week like that. Well, let's take it a step further. 
Who could I have stand and say, who impacted your life? Not just who did you impact, who, whose life? Because a lot of times we're like this. It's like, no, no, but nobody shows love to me. Nobody's sweet to me. Nobody, who are, he that have friends must show himself friendly. A lot of times we come in and we're all about, man, you, you should be nice to her. You should, and nobody shook my hand. Man, we've all got to be that action and that attitude. Hey, we're, we're talking about being like Christ. Christ didn't just sit on, the, uh, on a rock somewhere and say, come on, if you want love, come get it. No, he went out to people. Now listen to this. Greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. L- lay down your life. This is not common in this world. This is agape love. This isn't the world's love. This is God's love. Man, to lay down my desires, to lay down my plans, to lay down my needs for the sake of others, to give of myself, to give sacrificially. So what does this look like? Let me tell you right now, I I just read two passages. This is a great commandment. Do this to be like Christ. This is a commandment that I give it to you. All these things. Now I'm going to show you the the last time I'm going to make you turn in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 2. Keep going to the back towards the back. Philippians chapter 2. And we'll stop right here. We're going to do an expository study through this passage right here. I want you guys to see. We've got to get it. We've got to know what is it that God wants for us. This greater love that's to be lived out in our life. How is it practiced? What does it look like? How does it change? How does it affect people? Now listen to this. Philippians 2, 1. If, if. I mean, if, if there's going to be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, there's going to be any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, and that the consolation in Christ means the support and unity. Say, so, man, if there's going to be support and unity, I'm going to tell you how to get it. He said, if there's going to be any comfort in love, that comfort and love is talking about a joyous, Love, guys, there should be a love in this room that is nothing like anything in the world. Nothing in the world. There should be a love greater in this room that's more authentic than when you'd find in a bar or a hangout or any place in any kind of club in this world. There ought to be something authentic and real. A comfort of love. A mutual love. A bond of love towards one another. A fellowship, a communion, a connection between Christians. Now, I know we don't use this next word a lot. Actually, we don't use it in this reference at all. It says bowels. It means inward affection. Deep, real love. Men, go down to Hallmark. <laughs> and say, I love my wife with all my bowels. And ask them if there's a section on that. Now, you say, it doesn't mean the same. I know it doesn't. Delete that off the, the tape, please. <laughs> It means a deep, inward, affection, yearning, love that comes from the inward of a person. It's a deep, connected love. You see that this is, this is the theme of what the church should look like. This is the theme of what we should act like. This is the theme of what people should feel and experience. Whether they've been in the church for 50 years or they've been in here for 15 minutes. Well, there, there ought to be a bond, a fellowship, a communion, an atmosphere. Paul says in verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being, being of one accord and of one mind. I'm, I'm just describing the church right now. We're going to get to the points. We're describing, he says, to be like-minded means that the word of God affects us and we all have the same focus. It means that whether you walk up on this stage in three, four weeks or whatever we get up here, you, whatever part you play that we're all on the same mind that it's not about me having a role or me having a mic or me getting applauded it's about like-minded that God is the focus that's it all of us I tell you, I, I, I will step aside if God wants me to rather the clean toilets as opposed to being behind the, the pulpit be willing to do whatever it takes to lift Jesus up Amen. it's not about us like-minded same love not a selfish love. The same love. The love of Christ, self-sacrificing. And then it goes in and says of one accord. This is where I start getting into the focus of this greater love. This one accord brings us together. It makes us stronger. It is, if you ever do a search on one accord in the Bible, the Bible talks about constantly that the church is united. 
that we serve together, that we love together, that we go through the hard times together, that we go through the good times together of one accord. It, the, the definition means this, meaning much closer than, and it gave a lot of other things me, but in the definition it says much closer than just friendship, much closer than just an acquaintance. You, you guys realize that what, what this is, and it, it's, there's a deeper connection between God's people that God desires through that greater love. This is, this, I'm going to tell you like this. It'd be like this. Let's say you're out in the community, and you say, oh, do you know that person right there? And you say, oh, yeah, we go to church together. And that's as much as you know about them. That's not greater love. I'll give you an example. It'd be like if I'm out and, they, and I'm with my wife and they say, do you know that girl? I said, yeah, we live in the same house together. <laughs> Telling somebody that you faithfully attend the same building on 4701 Winchester Pike is not what God's talking about of greater love. Okay, and, and I'm not saying, man, praise God, we go to church together. But I'll tell you, it means more to know what they're dealing with. It is more important that, that I can reach in and tell them what they're suffering with and their heartbreak. And yeah, that guy right there just recently lost his mom and he's going through a hard time and blah, blah, blah. And I go into it and explaining who that person is. One accord. One accord. It's like seeing a rope that has all those tiny little strands through it, but together they come together and make something strong. This is one mind, one direction. Knowing time is short, knowing that people need the Lord, and we mean we get out of our way to meet people. Now I'm going to show you guys that this, this you say, oh, man, this is wonderful. Can you imagine one accord, one mind, like minded, uh, you know, united together, that greater love, the atmosphere, all these things that we're talking about, man, that's wonderful. You say, why, why aren't more churches like this? We just explain what the church looks like because there's more to it. Verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Do you know what strife is? It's the opposite of one accord. See, the devil wants nothing more than to get in and separate us and to wedge us and to get us disgruntled. And we don't listen to the pastor because I'm upset with the pastor. And I don't shake his hand because I'm upset with him. And, I, 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 and guys, let me tell you, we all have feelings and opinions and all this. But I tell you, the Bible talks about the greater love that we have for one another ought to be greater than any one of our personal opinions. Let nothing, the Greek word for that means nothing. Let no ministry, let no discussion, let no Facebook post, let no Easter drama, let no music program, no, let, let no leadership whatsoever be done through strife. Nothing whatsoever. Strife is an attitude or a spirit of contention. We, we don't do anything with the intention of throwing some out there or a phrase out there or on Facebook or anywhere else with the idea that I'm going to try to get a result that will cause division. If you deliberately walk around making statements to get people agitated, you are a problem for unity. You are a hindrance to what God wants to do. We are not out to prove that we're better. We're not out to divide. We're not out to cause fights. And you say, well, wait a minute. If something's wrong, you're right. We are to speak, but we're to speak the truth in love and address things to bring unity back to what God wants. And it keeps going. It says, but, with, but in lowliness of mind, lowliness of mind, the humility of myself of saying, you know what? It's not about me being right. It's not about me proving my point. It's not about me being applauded. Let us esteem others better than themselves. As I give you my points this morning, I'm going to reverse this. Rather than the perspective of you, I want to do this from the perspective of the person sitting next to you. What if you knew their heart? What if you knew my heart? I want you guys to see why God gave this this passage, because he goes through and explains how we can have these things that we're talking about right here. Here's the reason why. Because I need you. I'm not just talking about me. And you could look at the person next to you right now and say, I need you. And then you, you can turn around in your chair right now and say to the person behind you and say, I need you. That's not being selfish. It's, it's being transparent. It's being real. Guys, here, here's one thing that people have the idea. 
well, Pastor Tony studies his Bible all the time, and he walks with God, and he prays, and, da, 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 and we go all these things. And I tell you, I, I, I have the coolest job in the world that I get to walk to an office, and part of my daily routine is opening the Bible and studying it, but that doesn't mean that I don't have problems. And it doesn't mean that I don't have struggles and it doesn't mean that I don't go home and struggle with my wife. It doesn't mean that I don't get frustrated with my kids. It doesn't mean that I don't have bad days. It doesn't mean that I don't want to quit. I said, oh, well, you just, you know what? If we were more real with each other, we would have less problems. You can walk in here with your family Bible under one arm and holding your wife's hand in a four-piece suit. I don't know what that would look like, but doesn't mean you don't have problems and what God's trying to say through all of this that every single one of us have a need in our life that God created the person next to you to help fill that need you were not designed by God to walk alone your job is to love others to meet needs To lift them up. The reason is because we need each other. As a Christian. I tell you. Making this person will will get down. And sometimes you can even feel like you're all alone. Let me tell you. When you get alone. And you separate yourself from what God has for you. Let me tell you. You will struggle and have problems in your life. Richard, can you pull up Hebrews 10, 25? You guys don't have to turn there. Let me, it's, it's a verse that we know very well, but I want to point out a word at the beginning of this. And people, people have this idea about church and the things that we do and saying, is this important? Let me show you. The word not forsaking. That, those words right there, not forsaking. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It means not neglecting. You, you forsake something that literally means that you turn your back on it or you have it in your mind that I don't need that. The Bible says do not put it in your mind that you do not need the assembly or the collection or the gathering of God's people. And it goes on to some other things that we'll be hitting later. But you know what the Bible is emphasizing in this? That the reason a lot of people, and, and just, just being totally honest with you guys of where we are, we are losing the battle in a lot of ways where a lot of Christians are, are literally struggling in ways of their life because they, we, we have way too many casualties in the church. Way too many. Not forsaken literally means don't leave it out. God says that our, our job of being connected to other believers was not a suggestion. And it says, and so much more as you see the day approaching, literally meaning the closer we get to his return, the more we need each other. Those in your role right now need you. And let me tell you, you need them. Back in Philippians chapter 2, but in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Now notice this word. The word look at the beginning of verse 4. The word look means to notice, to pay attention, to take aim, to regard, to consider, to take heed, to look at, to look on, to open your eyes. Do you realize that what it's saying right here is the things of others. God says your job is to look upon, to take notice of their absence, of their hurts, of their discouragements, of their successes. Look not every man on his own things. Here's here's what it is. Number one, this means I need you to notice me. I I need you to notice me. We We have husbands that are slipping. We have Christian singles that are struggling in this world. You guys realize this is gonna this is gonna shock a lot of you, but would you believe it right now? But not by a raise of hands by any means whatsoever. Would you, would it, I shock you to tell you that there's probably somebody here or multiple people here this week that contemplated suicide. Do you know that there's probably couples that have walked through the room here today that have debated on whether or not they want to remain married? Do you know that there's some young people right now that are so distraught over life that, 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 that they're hurting their own bodies and contemplating stuff that is beyond what you could ever imagine? You say, what is the hope of them? You. You. 
See, I'm not making this up. When the Bible comes in and says, why is there so many casualties? See, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. We're looking on the needs of others as he went around saying, are you okay? When he went up to the woman at the well, when he went to that woman that came in that was a prostitute, and he stopped and paid attention to her. When that leper and that outcast and that person, do you know who Jesus put his eyes on? The people that needed him. See, I'm just being honest, right, guys? I need you to notice me. Let us consider, let us take notice, let us look upon, not your own needs, but look upon the needs of others. And so often we walk around, you know what our attitude is? We walk in and it's like, well, I I think it's hot in here and I'm tired and I don't want to be here and I don't like her and I don't like that shirt. I don't like this song. I, 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 I. And all the time the person right next to you is sitting there going, I don't know if I want to live. I don't know why I came. I'm so glad that God wasn't focused on himself when he walked this earth as Jesus. As he went looking for the heart of compassion to find those that were hurting, let this mind being you. You see, this is, this is greater love. It's not natural for you to think like this. We live in a selfie society. We do. I'm not saying it's bad, but this, this is, you know, I, I've never done it. The, the fishy face and all that other stuff where it was like. <laughs> I have never posted a, a selfie in all of my life. I just like, I do it. I look like, you look like an idiot. It's like. I, I just I just can't do it. It's just, but we, we, we do. We live in a selfie. Look at me. Look what I'm eating. Look what I'm doing. Pay attention. I mean, it's just, just very inward focused. That's how we are. Why? Because it's, and I'm not, not, I'm not knocking everybody that has ever taken a selfie. That's not my point. Okay, I'm not saying that. But it's easy to be focused inward. And so I, I, was, I went to the store yesterday. And I pulled in the parking lot. I had to be back here by a certain time. I was running out to the store. I, trying, I, mean, I had a list of things that I wanted to do and get done and everything like that. So I pulled in this parking lot. And p- for whatever reason, stores were jammed yesterday. I don't know if everybody's getting their tax refunds back and blowing it all at once or what. But I, I could not find a parking place. So I pulled around this corner. And a lady was backing out. So I stopped there. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to take this right up front. This is going to be great. And then she pulled out, and right behind her was somebody coming this way, waiting for the same parking spot. So I punched it and cut them off, and I gave them a track. It's all right. <laughs> no, I, uh, I sat there, and I thought, I'm in a hurry. I was here first. I, and then I thought, you know what, dude, you were just studying your Bible about think not on your own thing, but think on the needs of others. And I, 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 I motioned to her, led her, and she was like, looked at me funny. I was like, oh, okay. And she took it, and I parked in the back and all this. It was, it was fine. Do you know, do, can I tell you guys, that goes against our nature? To have the attitude of I'm going to go out of my way for the sake of somebody else and not for the sake of myself goes against our nature. To have the mind of Christ who saw my need saw my pain, stepped into my life to make a change. Who can say that about you? Because I tell you, walking up to somebody and shaking their hand saying, I love you, buddy. I love you, sister. Man, I love you, man. Does not do what God did for us. And I'm not belittling, greeting people. I need you to notice me. Number two, I need you to push me. I need you to encourage me or however you want to write it down. But it says in verse 3, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. To esteem or to place in high regard. It's not about promoting myself, but lifting up others. Hebrews 10, 24, you know, the not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And that same passage in verse 24, it says, let us consider The word consider means to take notice of one another, to provoke unto love and good works. And I've preached on this before, and I know that most of you know this, but for the sake of those that don't, the word provoke means to stir up or to sharpen. Do Do you realize that I've got an obligation as a Christian to esteem you better than myself? Rather than it being about myself, Jesus came and he found the disciples and he walked with them and he said, I'm going to teach you guys to be better than what you are. 
I'm going to help you guys draw closer to God. I'm going to push you to know him. I'm going to push you to be better. I'm going to push you to be a better husband and a better father and a better mother. Do you realize that's your job? You sit there and say, well, what did I get out of the message? Or what do I like? And you guys say, well, well, wait, get your eyes off yourself. Who did you help today? Jesus laid down his life, took the nails, took the beating, took everything for you, for us. This whole thing is, let's esteem others better than ourselves. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Listen to this, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying or lifting itself up in love. See, if I love you, my goal is for you to know Jesus more tomorrow than you knew him today. Amen. You say, isn't that what you're trying to do as a pastor? Amen. That's exactly. Guys, I'm, not, I'm up here right now preaching and studying and sharing and telling you because my goal is for every one of you to walk out of here with the idea that I need to know God with all my heart. I need to love him with all my soul. I need to love him with all my mind. I need to be changed. I need to be better. But let me tell you, that's not just my job. It's all of your job. So you've got a responsibility to help other people to draw closer to Jesus. To esteem them, to build them up, to look them at a value to God. And, and I'm talking about for, for the, the people that come in that, that don't look like they've ever been in church and the people that have been here all their life. God is not a respecter of people. Neither should we. Right. Having the idea that people that are in the messes are there because nobody came alongside of them to help them stay on track and be where they should be. Increase his body. Second Peter 1.13 says the same thing. Yea, I think it meets as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up. I love that, to stir you up. Second Peter 1.13, to stir you up. Why, why is it so much easier to tear people down than it is to build them up? Here's what I'm talking about. It is easier to complain than it is to build somebody up. It's easier to be negative than it is to be positive. I, I can always find something negative to say. You know what I'm saying? You just walk in a situation, you can find something negative to say. But to come along somebody, to have them provoke you, then to honestly reach into your life and say, how are you? And then then say to find and say, no, how are you really? What is your life like? What is your walk like? What is your marriage like? How is life going in your life right now? There's a lack of this and people are struggling and they are hurting. Let, let me read a verse to make applications. Ephesians 4.29 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. I, mean, I'm, I just had a curiosity. I'm, I'm going to show, uh, prove a point with this. Guys, it, it's, it's hard to provoke someone, and it's hard to encourage, and it's hard to push them. You know what I'm saying? When they're struggling, somebody needs to come along and just push you a little bit. You guys know what it's like when you just get sluggish and you're just like, come on, let's do this. Man, how, how, how are you doing with your wife? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, man. I, I haven't, I, I didn't do one thing for her for her Valentine's Day. I didn't go out. I, you know, just, the other guys, you know what you need to do if you're a brother and you love them, that greater love that God's given, you get them there and you just give them one of these right there. Say, so well, that, that's not love. No, that is love. You provoke them to love and you provoke them to do good works. You provoke them, you help them, you push them to get where they should be because the devil is after them to take away all the good things in their life. So, oh, like their car and their Starbucks card and all that. No, I'm talking about, I, I'm, I'm talking about their wife and their kids. We've got sluggish dads and sluggish moms and apathetic kids and we've got all these problems and nobody's reaching into their life to say, what are you doing about it? Just out of curiosity, you guys help me with something. How many of you are, are in a life group right now? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, look, look at all those hands. You guys can put your hands down. How many of you would honestly say the people in your life group have helped you do what I'm just talking about right now? You guys can put your hands down. You know why that's true? Because you cannot provoke people when you're not around people. If you're not connected, you know why Jesus walked with 12 men? Because he was connected with them to help them be where they ought to be. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really tired of casualties. I'm really, I'm really you know, don't take this the wrong way. I'd rather preach this from the pulpit than to have to help people from my, behind my desk. 
And I'm not saying that because I don't want to help people and don't discourage you from calling me saying I need to set up an appointment. But I'm telling you, if we would get on the ball and do what's right, we can avoid counseling when we're living right to begin with. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, to lift each other up. I need you to notice me. I need you to push me. I need you to help me. Verse 6, Philippians 2, 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on him the form of a what? Servant. Who was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How many of you are ready to be like Jesus? <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. It's like, what did he do? All right. That came obedient unto death. This passage is connected to, to the Last Supper when Jesus took off his outer garment, which represented him being rabbi, and got on and took on the form of a servant. And he got down and he washed Peter's feet. He washed Judas's feet. And I've said this before. Let me tell you guys what I would do if I was there. I would, have, I would have went up to Judas and I would have said, what thou do is do quickly, let him get out and just wash the eleven's feet. Because that's in my flesh. You see, what Jesus was doing, he was showing greater love because he was willing to get his hands dirty even for people that did not like him or serve him or edify him. Guys, the, the thing is, I, 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 I need you to help me. You see, this was the servant of Jesus Christ, which was more than just words. He became obedient unto death. He took their sin. He took their dirt. Literally, physically in that room and spiritually on the cross. You see, people need your your help with their problems in their life, but they need your help more with their spiritual problems in their life. They say, well, I thought that's why we go to church. That's great. we, We do go to church. But that, that edifying of the body what literally means the whole body fitly joined together. It means that the people next to you need to be doing it just like I am. If all you are is tapping in on Sunday with that IV and getting, a, getting that, it's, it's like a, surviving on a Red Bull a week, okay? It's not the way that God designed for us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life. How far would you go for those that you love or those that you claim to love? How far would you go for the one sitting next to you? Would you be willing to get your hands dirty for the sake of helping them get through a hard time? Or to carry their burden? To teach them? To love them? To lift them up in prayer? Let me ask you this. If I messed up, would you help me? Just think about that. If I messed up, would you help me? What about the person next to you right now? What, what about the people that are in here? Would, would you help them? Jesus took on the form of a servant. You know what a servant does? A servant serves. You say, oh, that's real deep. No, that's the reality. Your job, and Jesus got up from that, and he, he walks over and he starts to take communion, and he said, oh, by the way, what I've done, I've done as an example unto you. That you do unto each other. You say, what is the point of this? See, if we're going to change the world out there, We've got to do things right in here. And we can sit all day long and say, man, we are a church. And we're a body of Christ. And we love each other. And we do this. There's a whole lot more to this than words. To connect to people's lives and to get into their lives. And I tell you, today I did the easy stuff. Because next week we're going to get into I need you again. But only we're going to take it a step further than what we talked about right now. Greater love is shallow if it's just something we do on Sunday. Greater love is shallow if it's just a religious activity. Greater love is shallow if you claim it and all it is is a building that you attend. But if you want to change the world, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ.